tonight. Protesters around the world today hit streets to demand faster action on climate change. Of the rich against the poor. Our leaders are not leading. This is what leadership looks like. The Prime Minister returns with a renewable focus. But I want the population of Trinidad and Tobago to understand that it is not something that is to come. It is something that is here already. A choice between the present and the future. But our presentation to this conference, to the world, was that we expect that the change will come to people like us in a reasonable and manageable way. Tonight, episode four of a six-part CNC3 special series. The future of the country is at stake here. It's the week where the rubber hits the road. Major decisions are already being made at the COP26 conference, some of which will have an impact on Trinidad and Tobago. Good evening, I'm Ryan Beju. Welcome to the beginning of our final week of special coverage of the 26th Conference of Parties taking place in Glasgow, Scotland. Prime Minister Dr. Keith Rowley returned home from the conference on Saturday night and hosted an hour-long press conference at the airport. Now, remember last week I spoke about the delicate balancing act between lives and livelihoods in the operation to reverse climate change. This is how the Prime Minister put it after returning from Glasgow. Frankly, we are not out front waving a flag and demanding that the world turn upside down here. We have to be very cautious and sh accepting that there is a climate change problem, accepting that is driven in large part by the use of hydrocarbons that are released into the atmosphere, carbon dioxide in particular. And of course, that change will come. But our presentation to this conference, to the world, was that we expect that the change will come to people like us in a reasonable and manageable way. Now, there are small pockets of things happening in TNT that is edging us towards a more climate-friendly society. And corporate TNT has already begun investing in more climate-friendly projects. But does it actually bear fruit? Is it a worthwhile investment? And are we getting anywhere with it? Earlier today, I sat down with Republic Financial Holdings Limited CEO Nigel Batiste, whose organization has already started taking a climate-friendly approach. Mr. Nigel Batiste, thank you very much for accepting our invitation. Thank you, Ryan. So Republic Bank has made a significant sum, you know, set aside for green projects. Uh, have your customers, you know, been interested and shown interest in having some of these projects, you know, developing some of these projects, utilizing this fund? Thus far, the main interest has really come from our clients in Barbados, you know, where we have been able to, to finance two projects, one dealing with a wind farm and the other dealing with a solar project. Why did you guys see it necessary at Republic Bank to start this, this fund at this stage? I think it is a combination of factors. Roughly a year or two years ago, the bank recognized that something different needed to happen in that entire environment, social and governance space. And in our research, we recognized that a number of leading financial institutions had in fact signed up to a UN initiative called the Principles of Responsible Banking. And so Republic Bank went in September of 2020, we signed up for that Principles of Responsible Banking. And since then, we have been exploring ways that we could bring those principles to life for our clients. And this 200 million US commitment for green projects is just one manifestation of how we are bringing it to life. Right, Republic Bank operates pretty much throughout the Caribbean, into Guyana as well. Uh, have you seen from your experience, you know, that climate change is affecting things, perhaps how Republic Bank tends to lend money? Well, it hasn't begun to, to affect how we, how, we, how we lend thus far, but we have seen the impact of climate change in all of the environments in which we are operating. In Guyana, for example, you know, there has been an increase in flooding. So that's a clear manifestation. In the Eastern Caribbean, you've seen the impact where the storms are much fiercer. You have the hurricanes, there was the volcano in St. Vincent. I mean, you can't say that's directly as a result of climate change, but climate change is exacerbating the problem in all of those territories. Do you feel and have you gotten the sense that there is growing pressure from maybe even shareholders or the general public uh, for Republic Bank to fund more green projects? I think there is. 
slowly but surely the, the public needs to understand fully the impact of green financing, the impact of climate change. I don't think the public really is feeling it just yet, but I think it will come. Do you think over time some of these projects will be able to turn a profit? That is the expectation, but we need to break the projects down. I mean, you do have the projects which are in energy generation, and so really is displacing current means of generating energy, and that's where the wind farm, the solar, those kind of projects come in. But then you also have simple projects, which are the efficiency projects that customers can do to actually improve the operating costs, especially those customers who are in high energy cost jurisdictions. And you have a third project type of project, which is the electric vehicles, which also reduces ongoing operational costs for individuals. Once people kind of begin to realize that, I think that all those projects will be profit profitable. From what you've just said, do you feel like these types of projects are more risky, I'd, I'd say, uh, than traditional lending? I think the more risky project will be those in the energy generation because you are dependent on a correct environment being created. Barbados has created that environment by having an infrastructure where you can sell that energy that you are creating to the grid. And so you're more or less assured and there's a pricing regime in place. And once that pricing, pricing regime sticks, then those projects will be okay. I think those are the more risky. The other ones I'm seeing really as being cost displacement. And once clients understand the extent of the cost that is being displaced, it really will be quite successful and much less risky. The money that has so far been set up, is this a revolving... It's 200 million US. Um, it's not revolving as yet because we haven't really used that much of it. I hope it becomes something where you, the bank has to refresh its commitment sooner rather than later. I, I'm saying that all right now it's 200 million and hopefully in the future, if it is used properly, it can be renewed. Um, does the bank feel that it can perhaps better its return on, on this capital? I think it depends on how you define return. I mean, we are looking at this as a very, very long-term investment. And so in that respect, yes, because uh, Republic Bank has been around for 186 years and we hope to be around for another 186. And we can only be around if the, if the world is around. How do you think banking... Uh, especially when it comes to local banking, is going to change in what is being deemed a decisive decade in our country. And we're talking again in the environmental space. I think all of the banks are going to um, start promoting energy efficient lending. All of the banks are going to start promoting lending that helps to displace current ways of generating energy. So I think it will change significantly over the next five to ten years. Do you think our population, your customers, a lot of your customers from this population are adequately prepared for the changing scope of banking in this country? Again, if we're talking about in the energy area, the customers don't really appreciate, I think, as yet, what uh, the climate change impact on them will be. I think once they do appreciate what it will be, they will see the benefit of the change. You say that. Um, you know, what initiatives has your bank, um, having had this $200 million, you know, what initiatives have you guys sort of thrown out to encourage green projects? Well, that's it. So, so all of this is work in progress. And for a cl customer's perspective, you know, beyond the esoteric benefit of a, of a greener world or a blue ocean, the customers need to see something tangible to them. And so while it doesn't directly impact any 200, you're already talking about lower cost of borrowing. And so that's what we're working on. There's a lower cost of borrowing. There's technical assistance in the area of green technology because people hear the words, people read it in, a, in maybe a magazine or newspapers or hear it on the news, but nobody knows what it means directly. So the bank is also making available technical assistance so people can understand exactly what this means to me, what do I have to do? You know, and then, of course, if you do it, you know, the cost of financing is also lower. As president, what is your vision for it? What would you like to see for it? What would you like to see for the, for the Green Climate Project? For this fund, what would you like to, what is your ideal vision for it? Well, it gets fully deployed, right? And it gets fully deployed in a combination of projects. I mean, there are projects in the agricultural space, there are projects in energy generation, there, there, there are projects in energy displacement, which is what I talked about, electric vehicles. I mean, there are so many different types of projects that would fall under the umbrella of contributing to a greener climate. That I, my vision for it really is that this fund is fully deployed within the next two to three years. So by 2025, we should be having a conversation about Republic Bank having to refresh this commitment. And speaking about Republic Bank, uh, are you 
a little bit disappointed that other banks around the Caribbean haven't taken, as yet at least, the same route that your bank has taken? That we know of. I mean, I, I don't know what the other banks have been doing to their clients directly. I do know that the Canadian banks, RBC, CIBC, Scotia, just recently all signed up for the Net Zero Banking Alliance, which is something that Republic Bank signed up to in April, which suggests that there will be activities that are taking place. Because with this Net Zero Banking Alliance, you have to make a commitment that by 2050, okay, your activities will be net zero in terms of their impact. And within 18 months of making the commitment, you have to give specific targets. So I think it's only a matter of time. It is only a matter of time. That. That's what I was going to ask you. Do you think it's just a matter of time before everyone has to sort of readjust and be on the same page? If they haven't done so already. Mr. Nigel Batiste, you spared us some time out of a very busy day for you, and that we really appreciate. Thank you so much. Thank you, Ryan. Very interesting conversation with Nigel Batiste. So there are pockets of things happening in this country to begin combating climate change. The challenge now is how do we get more people involved and how do we get more people aware? Still to come tonight, unprecedented flooding across towns in Trinidad and Tobago. How much of it can actually be attributed to climate change? We have a special report from Kalein Hussein. And later, we go to Glasgow where TNT journalist Zico Kozia is there for the COP26 conference. When it rains, it floods. It is an accepted norm in Trinidad and Tobago. But is this due to climate change or are we just a country with poor drainage, poor garbage disposal and a lack of proper planning? In this report, Colleen Hussein explores how climate change is playing a part in new rainfall patterns across this country. In the last month, there were parts of Trinidad flooding, but it didn't take days of rains to cause rivers to overtop. Was this climate change or just floods in a flood-prone area? Scientists are observing changes in the Earth's climate in every region across the globe. For the Caribbean, the latest report from the Intergovernmental Panel for Climate Change had several major findings. The first, there is high confidence that observed warming in small islands had been attributed to human influence. In Trinidad and Tobago, our rainfall is primarily driven by heat, whether that be the temperature of the land during the day or the temperature of the ocean surrounding the country. Warmer temperatures result in more intense showers and thunderstorms. The next finding, the intensity and frequency of extreme precipitation and street and flash floods are projected to increase with medium confidence for 2 degrees Celsius of global warming and above. However, while extreme rainfall is projected to increase, overall rainfall may suffer. The report explains there is high confidence in a dominant increase in dry days and drought frequency. For the Caribbean region, the declining trend in rainfall during June through August will continue in the coming decades, particularly if global warming reaches 2 degrees Celsius and above. For Trinidad and Tobago, the impacts of climate change have made itself known in the last two decades. In 2018, one of the worst floods in modern history affected up to 80% of the country. Two years later, water levels in the nation's largest reservoir, the Kearney Arena Dam, reached its lowest ever recorded. The country, even with its short-term droughts, continues to see severe flash flooding events with torrential rains. The Trinidad and Tobago Meteorological Service Chief Climatologist Kenneth Kerr says climate change is the single biggest challenge for Trinidad and Tobago as an island developing state. The Met Office has noted that on average, rainfall at Piaco has decreased very slightly over the last 80 odd years, with 2019 being the third driest on record since 1960. Extreme rainfall is also on the increase as projected by the IPCC. Kerr explained that a larger percent of rainfall at Piaco has come in the form of intense precipitation in recent years. According to Kerr, six of the highest top 10 years for the highest one-day maximum rainfall totals at Piaco have occurred since 1990. With more intense short-duration rainfall, severe street and flash flooding events will become more common. With more torrential rainfall and a limited capacity drainage network, very little can be done to prevent watercourses from being overwhelmed. Unless significant capital is expended to address and maintain the nation's watercourses, 
a spilled bucket of water could still be enough to cripple a city. All right, thank you very much, Colleen, for clearing up the impact of climate change and all the flooding we've been having over the last two years. Great reporting. Speaking about reporting, coming up after the break, one young journalist from Trinidad and Tobago is in Scotland to cover the COP26 conference. We go over to Zico Cozia in Glasgow. Next. It's the most important meeting in the history of our planet. The world is tittering on the brink of a calamitous precipice, one in which there will be no coming back for future generations. It is the decisive decade to reverse the course of climate change, and it is the start of a decisive week in Glasgow. TNT journalist Zico Cozier is in Scotland, participating in a fellowship program for climate journalists. He joins us now live from the conference. Zico, thank you so much for joining us. Hey Ryan, thanks for having me. So what's it been like covering the conference so far for you? Um, it has been extremely challenging, but also really invigorating. Um, like you said, um, what happens here at COP26 is of great significance to everyone around the world, but especially to us in Trinidad and Tobago, as we live in a small island developing state. And I can tell you upfront that there's a lot on the line for small island developing states at this COP in particular. Wow. You, you know, uh, uh, we were talking a little bit off camera about the concerns some journalists have not being allowed in the negotiations and the decision-making meetings. How major and how big of a concern is that? Okay, so since small island developing states have been disproportionately affected by the pandemic, and of course, living in a small island developing state, you're already on the front line of the climate crisis. Right. Um, what makes the climate crisis so dangerous for us in small island developing states is the fact that, as a small island, one Category Five hurricane can wipe out your entire island. So when you add um, on top of that the effects of the pandemic, and you have little islands like Barbuda and Dominica that are still trying to recover from hurricanes that happened three to five years ago, and you have economies that are destabilized, you have a lot of difficulty. Um, being able to access something like COP26. If you look at the Pacific Islands, which is um, also small island developing states, some of them um, were not even able to send full delegations. So on top of actual national delegations coming to COP26, there's a lot of civil society representation um, and youth representation should also be here at COP26. Um, they, they pay a lot of lip service to giving everybody a seat at the table, making sure that underrepresented voices should be heard, right? Um, but this particular COP, despite being touted as one of the most inclusive in history, the reality is that it has been quite the opposite. Um, many people haven't been able to make it here. Um, 20,000 people have come, more than 20,000 people have come to COP in different capacities, but many of the people who are supposed to be having a say, um, who are living on the front line of the climate crisis, they're just not represented here at this particular COP. You, so your question about laser doing focused. This. You've been laser focused. I'm glad that you said that because you've been laser focused in on SIDs, uh, small island and developing states. Uh, do they have a voice? Do they have a seat at the table? So to tie back to what I was saying before, right? Um, journalists can not enter um, some of the meeting rooms where the negotiations are taking place. But normally observers who are people who come from civil society, NGOs and whatnot, they can normally enter and journalists depend on these people as sources to be able to report. And because of COVID restrictions, um, they've limited the amount of observers into many of these into many of these meetings to just four. So it has been frustrating. Many veteran journalists are saying that this is one of the most challenging cops ever to cover. And moving on to what you were saying now about small island developing states is that um, there's a lot on the line for us and the atmosphere right now is one of concern. Um, week one did not go well for small island developing states. And like you said, many have not even been able to be present. Um, some countries had to send reduced um, delegations due to COVID restrictions, expenses, just the logistical challenges of coming here. Every morning we are doing COVID, we have to do rapid testing just to enter the venue 
Um, it's been one of the most challenging COPs in history. Wow. And the agenda is twice as big as usual because there was no COP last year because of COVID. So there were efforts by, by the um, COP presidency to, to get people here and to put safety protocols in place. But of course, with the monumental task ahead, it quite simply just has not been enough. Um, there's also there's an element to a COP. Um, of course, there's a lot of backroom um, negotiating and deals um, being threshed out. That's, a, that's the meat of what's happening. But there's also an important role to be played for youth, for um, mm. indigenous people, um, for people who are activists to come here because the entire, there's media descending um, on Glasgow from all over the world. So if you come here as an activist with a powerful message, that message is going to reach people back in your home country. That message is going to reach people from around the world if you if you if you end up on an international um, news network. So it's really important that people come here to be heard because perhaps you might not be able to directly influence um, the negotiations um, that are taking place. Yeah. But if you can raise public awareness and get your message out to a large audience, um, it will go full circle. So because, can we, can um, we safely politics say, Zico, can what we... people are their home countries are advocate, um, are calling out for, yes. Can we safely say that the vulnerable, the most vulnerable in this climate crisis that we are facing have a voice at this summit? Hmm. It's very difficult. So in theory, um, the way that this conference works is that if you are a party to the convention, in theory, each party to the convention has equal say. But in terms of, in practice, how things unfold, um, obviously a lot, lot um, certain parties come into these negotiations with a much stronger position. And that's also too because it, um, the most vulnerable groups have a lot more to lose. So to understand how these scales are not balanced, what you're looking at is a situation where um, the G20 nations are responsible for 80% of greenhouse gas emissions in the world, whereas us small island developing states collectively, that's the entire, that's um, the, all the Caribbean islands, plus Pacific islands, plus some other small island developing states from around the world. Collectively, all small island developing states emit just 1%, less than 1% actually of greenhouse gas emissions. So we as small island developing states are coming into these negotiations, asking people for a lot because other people's actions have great consequence for us. So it's really hard to negotiate and bargain when you are asking others, this is what we need to survive. Yeah. And um, other developed nations, for example, are coming in from a different perspective. Yes, climate change is a threat to them, but the threat that they face is less imminent, it's less urgent. And of course, their, their countries are more resilient. Because like I said with Barbuda, which had to be entirely evacuated in 2017 after Hurricane Irma, that's an entire island wiped out by one hurricane. Yeah. A larger country, just because of land mass, because of size, the ability to bounce back is a lot stronger. Because if you get hit by um, an extreme weather event in one region, you have, other, you have the ability to support that region internally from within your country. I'm you just don't running out of time here. Zico. Yeah. But if I could just quickly ask you, there have been a lot of protests around Glasgow. People from all over the world have descended on Glasgow just to protest to demand climate action. Has that had any impact on the summit itself? So, um, like I said, I believe it's really important that young people, activists, um, indigenous people, people living on the front line of the climate crisis come to Glasgow and, uh, and future COPs because we're not leaving COP26 with a comprehensive deal that's going to put us back on track to 1.5 degrees Celsius. That's not possible at this point. But it is important that at future COPs that these people continue coming and continue having their voices heard because you might not be able to directly influence the negotiation as it takes place. But by coming here and using the platform that is created when the journalists descend on, on one location from around the world to focus specifically on climate change, what you do is you put your message at the forefront. You get it out to people because if everything goes full circle, um, politicians respond to what people back home care about. So if you get a large platform and you can raise awareness in your home country, if you can raise awareness from around the world, if you can get people to care, then you will force a response from those who have the power to make a change. 
Certainly. So Zico Kozia, thank you so much for taking some time out uh, from the conference. We can see in the background where you've been stationed and working at the Conference of Parties 26 in Glasgow. Please keep in touch with us and we really appreciate you taking some time out to chat with us. Thank you. All right. Zico Kozia, TNT journalist. Now, I also want to say thank you very much for your company and what is the start of a decision-making week in Glasgow. We'll have all the major decisions that are made and what they mean for Trinidad and Tobago and the Caribbean. We'll be back on on Wednesday night for another episode of COP26, Now or Never. Until then, have a good night.